the University of Miami has had a major effect on football, whether it be the college game or the NFL. The talent to come out of the hurricane program has been mind boggling. And the way that they went about their business on the field, I believe, truly got into the heads of the deep thinkers at the NCAA. And it made them change rules and policy that not only affected college football, but trickled all the way down and affected junior college football, particularly in the state of California. That's today on QB Unfiltered Flashback. I don't ever slow up. No, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. If you want to play tough and want to hate this, I'm always show up. The success and the dominance of the U's football program not only took its toll on opponents from coast to coast, but I believe that uh, they took up a permanent residence in the heads of the deep thinkers in the offices of the NCAA. This led to a few rule changes in regards to excessive celebration slash taunting and uniform rules. The excessive celebration and taunting rules were in direct response to the Canes' 1991 uh, Cotton Bowl win against the University of Texas, a game in which they not only kicked their tails on the field, but racked up over 200 yards, uh, penalty yards. And a good chunk of those penalties were 15-yard personal fouls. So that rule change was directly a shot at the Hurricane football program. The uh, uniform rules and modifications were not quite as obvious, but I think that they were also um, somewhat of a backhanded slap against the U and how their players dressed and did things on the field. So let's start with the excessive celebration rules. Okay, so it starts off, you know, with the, the Cotton Bowl game, and there's going to be a lot of people uh, associated with the NCAA that are going to say, yeah, that, that didn't have any effect on our thought process that, um, taunting and celebration just got out of control. And I would agree with that to a certain extent, but I could, I know for a fact watching that game in real time that the NCAA had a huge, um, issue to deal with public relations issue. And um, it was a result of Miami's actions on the field of that, in that game. Now, let's talk about Dennis Erickson for a quick second. You know, I've been such a huge fan of the U since Howard Schnellenberger took over the program and got it going, you know, in the uh, dynasty direction and then handed it off to Jimmy Johnson and then handed it off to Dennis Erickson. Now, Erickson, and I'm going to do a show about this later on down the road, but Erickson doesn't get nearly enough credit for the innovator he was with offensive football in the 80s. And he pushed that uh, thought process and those schemes uh, through his uh, college tenure as head coach. And then once he got to the NFL, he kind of, you know, this kind of happens when, when coaches get to the NFL, they get conservative and basically change their thought process. I never thought I would see it happen with him, but it did. Same thing happened with Steve Spurrier. These guys go from uh, run and gun coaches and airing it out and just playing wide open football in college. They get to the NFL and it's like they, they're, um, you know what tightens up on them and they get really, really conservative and less successful. But let's get back to Erickson. So before Erickson was winning national championships for the U and before he was, uh, lighting people up at Washington State, he was at the University of Idaho. All right. And playing in the Big Sky Conference, same conference that I finished up in. And during his tenure there at Idaho, he really introduced football to an offensive concept that changed the game. And so you're talking about uh, 
innovators, offensive innovators, and I'm talking about the passing game here. So you're talking like uh, Bill Walsh with the West Coast offense, uh, Air Coriel with the vertical passing game, Mouse Davis with the run and shoot, Hal Mummy and Mike Leach with the air raid. But Dennis Erickson in the 80s at the University of Idaho, what he did, which changed the game and it really lit defenses up, was he would line up in trips and he ran a traditional uh, trips with in regards to the tight end. So the tight end wasn't flexed out like a receiver. So he was the single receiver, but he was in tight, you know, lined up just outside the uh, tackle. And then he had three receivers the other way. And what Erickson started doing at Idaho is he'd take his single back and motion him out to the tight end side. So when the ball was snapped, they were in five wide, no backs. That little motion to a four from a four receiver set to a five receiver set, defenses lost their minds. Defensive coordinators lost their minds. And I've said this on other shows, defensively in pass coverage, they cannot account for the running back. So when you've got these offenses that uh, release their backs into the route, so they're running five receiver routes, running backs don't get covered. They, they don't get covered. And now you've got Erickson motioning his back out and the defensive coverage guys, well, it affected the entire coverage. As soon as that guy started to motion out, they had to change some things. And what you got in a ton of situations were uh, having one or two receivers, three receivers that were basically uncovered. There was nobody on them. You had defensive guys bumping out and screwing up that uh, misaligning and just basically losing their mind. And Dennis Erickson does not get enough credit for that. He took that scheme uh, to Washington State and then on to the University of Miami. And he had really, really powerful offenses at the U. But the one thing about Erickson, and I'm a big fan of his, but the one thing that you know you can always say about his coaching career he didn't exactly run a tight ship when it came to uh player discipline all right and the cotton bowl was a perfect example of that and the head coach can control what goes on what is allowed to go on what doesn't go on on the field in terms of uh, behavior by the players. And they stepped over a line in that game. I'm all for swagger. I'm all for having fun, playing with exuberance. But there comes a point in time where uh, the celebration and the taunting just is ridiculous and it's over the line. And that happened a lot in that cotton bowl game. I think that, you know, the NCAA started making uh, changes and it took a while, but up until around 2011, when they came out with the taunting celebration uh, rule up until that point in time. And since that 91 cotton bowl, there were small increments and in changes in how officials called the games in college football and junior college football. So the problem that this rule change created, well, it's, it's more than just one problem. Um, it's multiple, how I see it. And this is coming from me now being a head coach at Santa Rosa Junior College in Northern California. Um, and like I said, the stuff that happens at the Division I level trickles down to 1AA, Division II, NAIA, Division III, and then down to junior college. And so these celebration rules now were in full effect at the junior college level. And these were the problems that it caused. Number one, it got personal. Okay, so... You've got these officials, and this happens at every level, but you've got officials and coaches sometimes that just butt heads and don't like each other. And, you know, they can say this as much as they want. 
the officials are supposed to be neutral, but that doesn't happen in every case. And so when you've got a guy that um, has it out for a head coach, uh, he can really hurt that head coach with making some, uh, let's say, mysterious calls. And that celebration taunting uh, rule really allowed for that kind of shit to go on. And that did, in fact, happen. You also now are depending upon the... Um, how can I say it? The moral content of the officials, uh, whether a guy's a conservative type guy or more of a liberal type official, what one guy thinks is the way that the game should be played uh, versus a guy that thinks it should be played a different way. And um, that comes into play with these guys making calls because at the end of the day, folks, that taunting and celebration uh, call penalty really is up to the discretion of the official throwing the flag. And there have been tons and tons of those plays that were missed and weren't called by any officials. And there have been tons of those plays that were called and should have never been called. And so, you're now leaving it up to, you know, personalities and all that. And that's just uh, that takes away from the game. And then it's total inconsistency, you know, from week to week. There was no consistency in how officials were calling it. It also went from conference to conference. So, you know, when we're playing, we played the NorCal conference, which was the best junior college conference in the state, uh, in the years 2004 to 2010. I mean, it was, it was loaded. They called it the super conference, but that's a story for another day. But we're playing in the NorCal conference and you go out of conference to play a non-conference opponent and you've got officials from, uh, let's say you're traveling to that, that team's feel in that area geographically. You've got officials that are a part of that conference and they call it differently than the officials in your conference. And that was an issue. And the problem at the JUCO level with this is you've got guys that were working college games, um, guys that worked um, Division I games, like on a Saturday, but on a Friday night, they would work a JUCO game in Northern California. The biggest problem, though, was you had high school officials that also mixed in and refed junior college games. And you didn't exactly sometimes have the best officials that were crossing over and doing these games. And so you got a lot of really goofy scenarios and there was nothing consistent about it. And the fact that as a coach, you knew what the rule was, but you're trying to plead your case to these guys that don't understand, don't know, or think in their mind that they've got it right, even though it's wrong. And it just created a big pain in the ass for everybody concerned. So at the end of the day, all of this just creates a lot of unnecessary headaches for the coaches and the players and the fans. But it comes down to this. The head coach and the coaching staff control their players' actions on the field. And a lot of... Um, 15-yard personal fouls, that's a result of a selfish player doing his own damn thing. And we always used to tell our guys, you know, if you're going to make that dumb decision to be a selfish player, which is going to affect everybody on this team, you're going to do it one time, and then you're going to spend the rest of your time standing on the sideline right next to me watching the game. So it's your call. OK, but you get a lot of these coaches that just let it happen and they're OK with that. And it's going to happen again and it's going to happen again. So I'm a big believer in the fact that, well, I'll just put it to you this way. There's a 
there's a ton of college football teams playing in 2023, playing again coming up here in a couple of weeks that you can go watch their games. And before the game starts, you can tell yourself there is no way in the world that these guys are going to do anything stupid on the field or make any dumb, taunting, uh, excessive celebration penalties. Okay, it's all really based upon what the head coach will allow his players to do or what he demands his players don't do. Okay, so the taunting rules, I those were a direct shot at the Canes, right? The uniform rule is not as obvious, but as I start going through some of these uh, violations that found its way into the rule book, and for sure were in the rule book at the junior college level, as I'm going through these, I want you to ask yourself, thinking back and watching the Canes play, how many players were sporting some of these violations that I'm going to talk about? Okay, so the official updated rules on uniforms came out in 2018 and it basically had just three three rules but i'm here to tell you that there's a whole lot more that were in play for a long period of time leading up to 2018 but those three were the entire knee has to be covered by the pants and the knee pads Okay, which some of you guys are going, well, hold on a second, coach. I just watched games last year where some of these guys were wearing like shorts out there with no knee pads. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You didn't see that wrong. We'll talk about that here in a bit. Okay, the second rule was you can't show your stomach, which means you can't wear a crop jersey. You know, the jerseys that were cut off. Uh, right below the ribs, you could see, you know, about that much of this guy's stomach. Uh, no big deal, but uh, the NCAA says that you can't do that. And then the third one is uh, your T-shirt can't show below your jersey. So those are the three big rules. They, they sent these uh, rules out with uh, diagrams of what was accepted and what wasn't accepted. And uh, that's what they went with. Okay, now, I don't have exact dates or official rules that were put into uh, the NCAA rule book, which is a long, boring read. But I do know that I went through these starting in 1997. I got the JC job in 96. In 97, it really started to hit there in Northern California. Um, and again, these were things that were adopted from the NCAA level. So here we go. Let's start with the towels. The towels have always been a point of contention with the deep thinkers at the NCAA. It just is ridiculous. But here we go. No streamers, okay? A streamer is a towel about, I don't know, that thick, and it goes from, obviously, the belt down to about your knees. There's really there's really no practical use for streamers, um, but they're classified as towels, and the NCAA said no streamers. Okay, now with the towels, you couldn't wear a towel on uh, your butt, coming out of your pants on your backside. That towel had to be in the front or just off center to the front. Okay, the towel had to be white. The towel couldn't have any words or symbols on it um and you can use your imagination i mean there's nothing really uh sinister about any of that stuff i can remember there were guys that used to play that had skull and crossbones on their towels um there have been a ton of guys that have their their school mascot name on their towels or their jersey number on their towels whatever but they said no 
It has to be white and it has to be plain. Also has to be a certain length. Now they adopted this and stole this from the NFL, which has some ridiculous towel rules also. Um, but that towel had to be a certain length. So white, plain, worn in the front of the pants and a certain length. Then we move to wristbands. You couldn't wear your wristbands up on your elbow or your biceps because that has a big effect on the football game, right? So you couldn't do that. Then we move down to the shoes. You couldn't spat your shoes. Spatting your shoes is when you tape it on the outside of the shoes, it looks like you're taping your ankle like you normally would for a taped ankle, right? You leave the heel basically untaped and then from the um, arch of your foot out to your toes is untaped, but your ankle and everything else in that area is taped. And then that tape goes up above the ankles on the outside of the socks. That's called spatting. Again, the deep thinkers at the NCAA thought that that somehow, some way was was not acceptable. And so they um, made that illegal. You couldn't spat your shoes. OK, then we move to the eye black and um, think uh, Reggie Bush with the area code. Think Tim Tebow with the biblical verse. You couldn't have any writing or any symbols on your eye black. All right. And then socks. The socks all had to be the same color and the same length, which, I mean, you're really starting to get into really stupidity on some of this stuff. Um, the same color. Yeah, I'm all for that. The same length. Who cares um but that was the deal and then with the socks you couldn't have symbols and writing on there so you know we actually we went through all of these crazy ass things in junior college where the officials actually had cards that they had to check off uh in every pregame they would walk around and check both teams and check off and write down jersey numbers of players who were violating these uh uniform rules and uh it got so crazy that they wouldn't even let players get on the field if they had a wristband up on their elbow or their socks were just above their ankle instead of pulled up above their calf um so the socks then, you know, no Nike swooshes, no Adidas symbol, no nothing. Okay, you couldn't wear bandanas, nothing hanging out of the bottom of the helmet. You couldn't wear tights. Now, think back to Randall Hill, uh, University of Miami, <laughs> a very entertaining receiver to say the least. Uh, he used to wear orange tights under his um, game pants. So you got the bottom of the pants where the knee pads are, and then you've got the tights that go down to where then the socks start. And um, they didn't think that that was very cool. So at the JUCO level, you could wear tights, but everybody on the team had to wear tights. So if if everybody wasn't wearing them, then one guy couldn't wear them. Okay, so... You know, I'm sure that um, I'm going to get comments like, um, you know, it's a team sport. They all should dress as a team. You know, you got guys, you got some guys wearing wristbands up on their elbows. You got some guys, you know, wearing tights. Uh, you got some guys spatting their shoes. Uh, everybody should look the same. And um, I agree with that uh, when it comes to wearing the same jersey, the same pants, the same helmet, all right? I agree with you on that. But individuality has to exist on the football field. It exists in every sport, and it has to be that way as long as it's not a distraction or an advantage to the player uh, or just something so idiotic that it shouldn't be worn. 
Okay. Other than that, what's the big deal? I mean, you're wearing a helmet. That's the most important piece of equipment that you have. Uh, the shoulder pads, very important piece of equipment. And then um, everything else. I mean, we look at the game pants that some of these dudes are wearing today. Evidently, the deep thinkers in the NCAA do do not believe any longer that knee pads do anything for you, which they really never did, if you think about it. And so you got guys running around out there wearing bicycle shorts with um, pockets in them for the uh, thigh pads, you know, and um, you're wearing helmets and shoulder pads. Those are the most important things. And you've got the school colors on the same jersey, the same pants, the same helmet. Let them be in an individual and let them have fun. And uh, a lot of times those guys at the NCAA, they don't get it and they don't get it because they don't have any practical experience playing sports. OK, now, as far as the excessive celebration and taunting goes, think back to Michael Irvin, uh, Lamar Thomas and Randall Hill. OK, those guys were dudes that really enjoyed what they were doing on the field and they expressed themselves on the field. Their method of celebrating was wiped out by the NCAA, but look at what we're allowing these kids to do now, nowadays. The stuff that Irvin and Thomas and Hill did back in the day for the U is tame with what's going on now, where you've got choreographed production numbers you know, and it's just, you got the, the game pants now with no knee pads. It's like, geez. okay, so we're going to put a little bit more fun back in the game for the players, which is what it's all about anyway. And you allow the head coaches or rely on the head coaches and expect the head coaches to control their team and behave themselves accordingly. But individuals are going to be individuals within a team game, and that's what football is all about. In my opinion, both of those rules were a move to exercise power over a program that was getting too good and was getting too powerful, and they were providing too much of an example for other teams and other players, and they had to be held down a little bit. In my opinion, that's what went down with the University of Miami. Um, that's what I think. So if you enjoyed today's show, please hit that like button. Uh, share this out to your buddies. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, let me know in your comments what your thoughts are on the Canes. Um, i like to know what you think their effect has been on the college football culture since the 80s, the U, what they've done with college football. Okay, this is QB Unfiltered Flashback. And remember, always throw the ball short to guys who can score. See ya. I got no love for the fakeness. If you want to play tough and want to hate this, although it's your mother.